also to Tim Dwyer. And Tim's poetry has appeared regularly in Aries and UK journals, including Ciphers. Did I pronounce that right, uh, Tim? Ciphers. Ciphers. Ciphers, Orbis, Poetry at Ireland Review and Southward. He is the author of Smithy of Our Lo Longings and raised in Brooklyn by parents from Galway. He recently moved to Bangor from the uh, United States and he has long been inspired by Irish monastic poetry. So we're really looking forward, Tim, to your, your talk today, which is entitled Nature and Humanity in Irish Monastic Poetry. And just before we go, I just want to share this with you, um, if I can get it up. Now you can see this. Whenever I was in St. Gallen, this is actually the St. Gallen of Prisian, which is the original manuscript, which has been written by hand in Old Irish um, by monks from Bangor and in, we believe, in Nendrum. And actual fact, this page here, which the, um, uh, the, the, the librarian, chief librarian, Cornell Dora, opened it up and he said, this is a page from, um, which is written, he believed, in Nendrum. And I know Tim is going to be talking about this, but I just love this wee bit because I live very close to it, uh, to Nendrum. And I can just imagine a monk sitting there. I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, and it starts with, bitter is the wind tonight. It tosses the ocean's white hair. I fear not the coursing of a clear sea by the fierce heroes from Lothland. In other words, the Vikings, because it was stormy, it was windy, they weren't expecting the Vikings to raid that night. So I actually touched this book, you know, these pages, and it was absolutely marvelous just to see it. And as many of you know, and Maura fully explained to me when I met her um, a couple of years ago, that the Vikings, because of the raids of the Vikings in Bangor and around this area, that they took a lot of the um, scriptures and things that they had written inland, away from the sea, so they wouldn't be burnt by the Vikings. And as you all know, um, in the Milan and the Ambrosian Library has got the Bangor and Tiffany, but St. Gall, St. Gallen in the library there in St. Gall, they have one of the largest collections of Irish monastic um, writings and scribes uh, than anywhere else in Europe. So anyway, that's what it looks like. And maybe if we ever get there again, you might want to ask to see that. So anyway, Tim, over to you and very warm welcome. And thank you very much indeed for agreeing to be with us today. Thank you very much, Deborah. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in from your monastic Zoom cells. It's uh, great to be part of the Columbanus Festival this year. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, and I hope you can see Columbanus over here with me. Okay, my talk will be about the kind of early Irish poetry often described as hermit or personal poetry. I will present poems that were likely composed in the ninth century or earlier, including my translations of some of them and some of my poems inspired by them. I draw from the work of a number of scholars, including Kuno Meyer, Robin Flower, Kenneth Jackson, Gerard Murphy, James Carney, Alexander O'Hara, and Maurice Reardon. And the translations from many of our fine, finest poets. And I also thank the director of the Library of St. Gall, um, Cornell Dora or Dora Cornell, I never can get straight which is which for him, uh, for providing me links to the digital facsimiles of two of the poems. Irish poetry has been considered the earliest vernacular poetry written in Europe, that is, poetry written in the native language although the Irish monks also wrote poems in Latin. Many of these poems have been compared with haiku, having an unforced immediacy and blending of the spirit of nature and humanity. As in haiku, this is accomplished through essential brief impressions centered on words and phrases more than sentences. 1200 years ago and longer, these scribes discovered one of the keys to great poetry, essential words to express experience difficult to convey through language. 
If in poetry you elaborate with unnecessary and distracting words to try to pin down experience, then you miss the experience. As one of the great American poets, Emily Dickinson noted, poetry conveys life at a slant. I am using the term monastic and monk broadly to include nuns. Most of these poems are anonymous, so the gender of the poet is conjectural. Women poets at a slightly later date, such as Gormla in the 10th century have been identified and there are some outstanding poems in the voice of women, possibly composed by women, such as Jesus and St. Ida, the lament of the old woman of Bera, and Leodin tells of her love for Curraher. Although not all early Irish poems are brief, many of those best loved and translated by our best poets are 10 lines or less. It has been suggested that the rhymed quatrain, the four line stanza that became a standard in poetry was first crafted by these early scribes. Sometimes these quatrains stand alone, sometimes in a series. In the strongest poems, either in ancient Ireland or in the 21st century, each quatrain is a poem within a poem. There is also often a brevity in length of line. Some of the earliest poems are in what Kenneth Jackson has referred to as chant meter, a three syllable line with essential images, an incantation evoking mystery and prophecy. These are the poems that may hint at pre-Christian Ireland and may have been part of rituals at such times as the change of seasons. One cited by Jackson begins, good tidings, sea fruitful, strand wave washed, wood smile, witchcraft flees, and then ends with happy summer. The skilled use of the brief line while maintaining a flow throughout a poem is another fine accomplishment. I can attest firsthand that there is a risk of a fragmented, disjointed piece that becomes more of a shopping list than a song. And the early Irish poets were great at maintaining the song of a poem. Circumstances can affect the length of a poem. The great poet William Carlos Williams was a physician, and it is said that he often scribbled his draft on prescription pads between patients. Not to compare myself with the great Williams, but my tendency toward writing the brief poem was shaped by a small notepad beside me on a 40 minute drive to work. Now for our monastic poets, their circumstances were copying or reading manuscripts. Vellum is not easy to produce and it was used for copying parts of the Bible, hymns and other religious documents. Rarely was there any for personal use. Scribing could be a monotonous process, as could be memorizing biblical passages or learning Latin. Perhaps as a creative outlet, some would write short poems in the narrow margins, what is straightforwardly called marginalia. At other times, something on the page being written or read might have inspired a poem. Some of these poems were likely original, and others were poems that had been memorized and passed down. And as we will see, at least two of these poems were likely composed at the scriptorium of Bangor Abbey or Nendrum. Let me share a few other observations about the structure and form of early Irish poetry. It has been suggested that the Irish scribes were the first to include spaces between the words. They adopted and expanded the use of rhyme, and this includes internal rhymes. They were extremely skilled at alliteration, often in a chain from line to line that gives the poem in the original a sense of unity and music. 
they also make appealing use of what's called assonance, which is the resemblance of sounds between syllables of nearby words, particularly between their vowels. This is sometimes called near rhyme. And also consonants, the repetition of identical or similar consonants in neighboring words whose vowel sounds are different. For example, coming home, hot foot. So even in our best translations from our best poets and scholars, we cannot match the great sonic quality of the originals while also attempting to convey the poem's core. The early poems written in Latin often use such standard classical meter, such as dactyl hexameter, and the poems in Irish often made use of syllable count, often three, five, and especially seven syllable lines. Although the stereotypical motif of early Irish poetry is a solitary monk in spiritual communion with nature, I hope in the poems I present that I give some sense of the richness and diversity of the poetic themes. There are also poems that express the cruelty and severity of nature, poems of loneliness and longing, poems of satire, sarcasm, humor, and irony poems of love and friendship, and of course, poems of prayer and seeking a deeper spiritual life. For this presentation, I will focus on poems that convey a poet's personal voice that can reach to the reader across so many centuries. This kind of personal voice, without becoming overly the focus of the poem, is something from which much of our current poetry could learn. Along with their outstanding literary value, reading these poems on a personal note in the last two years have provided great comfort and enjoyment through a time of health issues and COVID. There are also many early Irish poems that are composed as hymns, biblical and moral teachings, monastic rules and elegies in a grand and somewhat formal language. Such poems would be a presentation in and of themselves. And today I am presenting as a poet, my PhD is in psychology, not in Irish studies or history. After I share the poems, there will be ample time for questions, comments, discussion, or some additional poems. We have some very knowledgeable viewers in our virtual audience, and I look forward to hearing from you. So I'm going to uh, go through some of the Bangor or Nindrum poems. We are very fortunate to have three poems that appear to have been written in Bangor Abbey or Nandrum, although it cannot be ruled out that two of these poems could have been inscribed by Irish monks after the manuscript had traveled to the continent. They are among the most engaging of the monastic poems, and a number of our top scholars and poets have translated them. They are excellent examples of the artistry of these scribes, conveying rich human and spiritual experience in a few lines. In a recent Zoom conference on Colum Kill I attended, one of the hosts referred to these poems as simple. And although on one level that is accurate, they are far from simplistic, but are profound. For each poem, I will first read the English translation and then do my best with my beginning Irish to read the original poem. But keep in mind, modern pronunciation of Irish is likely different than the pronunciation of Old Irish. This first poem is often entitled, Scribe in the Woods. All around me, greenwood trees, I hear blackbird bursts on high, quavering lines on vellum leaves, birdsong pours down from the sky, over and above the wood, the blue cuckoo chants to me. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. I write well beneath the trees. The Marquis, the Baja Fall, from Hain, Leach, Lewin, Lewin, Nakail, Louis, Ma, Lebron, in Lena, from Han, Tirek, in a name, from Hain, Kimen. Medermas, Timor Glass, 
the din rub dust, the bra um himja kima king scribum bo rida rus. This poem is circa early ninth century. The translation was by Kieran Carson, one of our finest poets born in Belfast, first director of the Seamus Heaney Center at Queen's University. Sadly, he died two years ago, right around this time. It appears in uh, Reardon's The Finest Music, which is a recent anthology of early Irish poetry. This is one of the poems from the St. Gaul Christian, which is a Latin grammar text that was an essential tool for young monks learning Latin. Um, it was great that Deborah showed the facsimile. Um, and I just have a uh, copy of the facsimile here. And as, as Deborah showed, right there, and there's the little narrow margin. So over two pages, this, this wonderful poem was written. The original is a seven syllable line, which is rich in alliteration, assonance, consonance, internal and end rhyme. Wonderful sensory movements, vivid sheltering trees, bird song, quavering lines, very tactile. There is a highly skilled use of synesthesia, the blending of sound with the sensation of liquid in the line, bird song pours down from the sky. With simple descriptions, present tense, and spatial phrases such as all around me, over and above, we readers are brought into the woods alongside the monk. It's wonderful personification of the cuckoo without overdoing it. Note the skillful ambiguity of the line, Dear Lord, thank you for your word. It could be either the bird or the monk in prayer. There was a belief that birds sang to praise God and that the, they were also birds in heaven. The understated ending allows the spirit of nature to remain the focus of this poem. Bird chants to monk, monk chants to God. It captures the scribe at his work, which could be very tiring, and how his attention is captured by the beauty of the woods. I'm not trying to go too far afield with this point, but given that this was an era that was primarily pre-scientific, there is an impression of the birds and even the trees as interactive, soulful. At least it appears that way to this reader. The monks thought of worldly creation as God's handiwork, and that is remarkably expressed here in eight lines. Picture this monk in a humble, wooded scriptorium in Bangor Abbey in the early 1800s. This poem had been associated with the monastic renewal movement, Kelly Day or the Coldies. Now here is one of my recent poems inspired by this ninth century poem. Just remember to become an anchorite or a hermit, it had to be earned by demonstrating a consistent and exemplary monastic practice. Once in Bangor Scriptorium, ninth century, the young monk weary of Latin grammar in dim light plows through Christian's tedium of proper pronoun use. His eyes wander to the bottom of the page, writes a few lines on the narrow margin, daydreams, the abbot sees his growth in humility and prayer, a blessing and consent to live as a hermit in the woods. Now this next poem is one of our best known early poems. It's often called Blackbird of Belfast Lock. Um, there's just a little illustration of a blackbird, a lovely illustration. The wee blackbird settles in a wind bush on the slope of the hill, then opens its yoke yellow bill. Now its fresh song rises up and fills the sky over Belfast Lock. 
Intain Vec, Role Fetch, Dorin Gwip, Glan Gwija, Foe Cared Feed, Us Black League, Lun Ducree, Ha Wija. This translation I read is by Tom Paulin. The scholar Gerard Murphy noted this poem appeared in an 11th century manuscript on poetic meter, and it was used as an example of the three syllable meter called Snam Sud. He estimated the poem was from the ninth century. The poem is rich in alliteration, assonance, and consonance, along with rhyme. With 24 syllables and its impressionistic tone, it is one of the poems that Kuno Meyer has compared with haiku. There are a number of wonderful poems that include the blackbird, one which alludes to the blackbird as a fellow monk. I could do a full presentation of those poems alone. Behind this also may be the lore of birds and bees as beings that move between this world and the other world or heaven. In a quatrain attributed to Callum Kill, for instance, the bee leaving the honeycomb appears to signify the soul at death leaving the body. I have included my translation of this poem as a first stanza to one of my own poems, which I'm about to read. And uh, it was inspired by thinking about the blackbird of Belfast Lock often while walking along the Bangor shore. My first draft of poems, my own poems, often begin as I walk along the strand. This poem of mine is included in a new anthology by Daedalus Press entitled Local Wonders. Note that Loch Lee is the old name for Belfast Loch and means inlet of the calf. Whistle across time. Over Loch Lee waves, yellow billed song of blackbird cast from wind blossoms. With cancer and pandemic comes urgency to find where on our shore a forgotten monk wrote this ninth century verse. I haven't heard a blackbird whistle over Loch Lee, but today a robin peeks out among wind blossoms, lands near my feet, and begins to sing. Again and again he flies from bush to strand. Flutter of belief, he's greeting me, showing me it was here. Now the next poem was likely composed in our region 1200 years ago and perhaps this time of year. This is uh, another translation uh, of one that Deborah read at the beginning of, of the presentation. It's often called Viking Terror. Bitter and wild the wind tonight, tossing the tresses of the sea to white. On such a night as this, I feel at ease. Fierce Northmen only course the quiet seas. Izahar in Gaish Inukt, Bafuisna, Afarga, Finfalt, Niagar, Reim, Moramin, Dun Leverd, Lan, Uch, Lothlin. This translation is by James Carney. It's in his uh, great book, Medieval Irish Lyrics. It's, it's one of the real key books. And again, this is from the St. Gaul Christian, probably the ninth century. And I have a facsimile. This one's written at the top narrow margin. Just, a, um, just an aside about the, the one thing that's very valuable about the uh, Christian is, uh, number one, it was really the textbook for the monks in learning Latin in Ireland. It was uh, composed maybe around five, in the 500s, maybe the middle 500s. And what has also been extremely valuable is uh, there are many glosses where uh, the, the 
the Irish monks learning the Latin were often writing the Irish words on, on the manuscript. And so it has been a goal, it was a real gold mine in putting together old Irish. So it, it's, it's a very valuable and, and, and the, the one that is at St. Gallen is very valuable for a number of reasons in terms of what it gives us about that early Irish monastery life. Now this, this poem, uh, again, written in the margins, we can conjecture that this poem was written close to the time of the Viking invasions uh, of Bangor Abbey and then Drum in the 820s or thereabouts. Poetically, it is a study of the great potential power in a brief poem, such as a quatrain and a great example for a contemporary poetry workshop of the practice, less is more. I believe it is the first poem of irony in Irish poetry. How skillfully this ninth century poet with a present orientation crafts an image of a beautiful yet dangerous sea and then effortlessly shifts to a sense of safety from attack. How in this understated manner, the fear and tragedy of that era are expressed. One can imagine a group of monks wrapping this and other manuscripts in a leather satchel and crossing that same sea to carry these books to safety of inland Europe, perhaps to one of the Columbanus monasteries, eventually reaching the library of St. Gaul. The Viking terror poem has been a favorite of mine for 40 years in its various translations. And it was a thrill after moving to Bangor two years ago when I realized I was at home of its origin. I often think of this poem when I walk the shore of Valley Home, where the burial site of a Viking woman was discovered in the early 1900s. As many of you know, the name Valley Home is derived from the Irish word balia for home or townland or place, and the Norse word helmer for meadow. And the brook there would have been a likely place for anchorites or monks from Bangor Abbey to have lived in solitude. I often look out toward Valley McCormick Point and imagine what the monks felt when they saw the first Viking longboat sailing toward the bay. During a necessary afternoon train ride from Belfast to Bangor, um, during one of the peaks of our COVID crisis, it was a summer day when the coaches were generally packed with teenagers on the way to the beach in Helen's Bay. The Viking terror poem came to my mind and inspired this little quatrain. Bitter wind and rain today, battering the Bangor train. On this day, I feel at ease. No unmasked teams for Helen's Bay. The rain saved me from a crowded train of teenagers on the way to Helen's Bay. Now, apology to our responsible youth. Now, along with irony, my little poem mirrors the use of sardonic humor, alliteration, and assonance that often is a feature of monastic poetry. You know, I have pictured how fitting it would be to have displays of these Bangor poems or Nendrum poems along our Columbanus coastal path, where these poems could be read by passers-by in the gem of a landscape where they were originally inspired and one that I hope we preserve. Now, here are a couple of brief poems of mine which were inspired by Congo. I, I always think we must never forget Congal. Colin Bannis, wonderful in, in terms of going to Europe, but maybe there wouldn't have been a Colin Bannis without a Congal. One of these uh, is written in a haiku or senryu form. The other is a quatrain. During COVID, I have often thought of the early monastery and how overlooked our heritage would be without the friends of Colin Bannis and the North Down Museum. This first poem was written at the peak of the first wave of COVID. Um, I have the word Cúin here. Cúin is the Irish word for haven, harbor, 
place of refuge. Kuin, Monk Kamgo, long gone. Now hermits walk along Bangor's sheltered shore. Now this next poem, Inverb Bug is mentioned. As many of you may know, what may have been Bangor's original name, Inverbug, meaning little estuary, according to tradition, is where Congo prayed with arms raised for hours while immersed in the stream. This stream has been culverted for many years, has had has had been an alleged uh, traditional holy well that had been located at the intersection of Dufferin and Southwell. Uh, this is a, a short quatrain. Congo raised his arms in prayer, immersed in winter waters. Inverbug is now entombed, covered with cans and bottles. I have imagined in support of our early heritage, uncovering the part of the stream that flowed near the abbey. Now, a year or two ago, I was fortunate to come across an article by an impressive scholar who had previously presented at this festival, Alexander O'Hara, a specialist in Columbanus. He and Professor Ian Wood have published a new translation of the life of Columbanus by Jonas of Bobbio. Alex noted that in the preface of that hagiography is a poem that has been largely overlooked by other researchers. Alex believes it was written by one of Columbanus's Irish followers in the seventh century and may be the first time in writing that Ireland is referred to as a whole. Alex corresponded with Seamus Heaney about the poem. Heaney responded very positively. It was shortly before his death. Fortunately, Alex was open to collaborating with me. My poetic translation is based on the excellent literal translation of Alex and Ian Wood. This may also be the first poetic translation of this piece into English. Next autumn, it may be included in the literary journal, The High Window, and I will be co-editing a section of that volume about early Irish poetry. As many of you know, the name Columban Latinized as Columbanus means white dove. Land's final curve, seventh century Irish monk. Ireland, where Columbanus, the white dove was born, sits at ocean's edge, waits for the setting sun. The world is turning, light falling into the sea, into the western shadows. The waves are huge mountains, colors wild, their tresses slap against the many caves. Blue crests wrap the shore in foam at land's final curve. They almost present, they almost prevent this coast we know so well from freeing our little curragh for the journey over seas salty swell. Above us, yellow strands of Titan sun descend dim, reach Arcturus, guardian star of night, follow the north wind. The sun will find the way once again to rise in the east. Revived, it will bring welcomed light, bright fire far and wide, to the shivering world. Through all the turning points of night and day, completing the course, the sun returns brilliance to the lands, a hearth giving the world fresh with dew, warmth and goodness once again. This poem was composed in Hiberno Latin in the classical dactyl hexameter. One of the strengths of this poem is that it has both a majestic visionary quality 
often found in the poetry of, for instance, the Iona Monastery, yet the voice of the poem remains personal with a vivid connection to the natural world that's animated in its verses. This might also be the first Irish poem to have classical allusions such as Titan and Arcturus. Perhaps in Bobbio at the time, there were manuscripts of the classics that influenced this poet. With the prominence of waves in this poem, you can imagine the old belief in the Nanan, Celtic god of the sea, who shows up in other poems of this period. And the image of the waves nearly preventing the monk's journey, perhaps never to return to the coast we know so well, might be a metaphor for the loss and mixed feelings of these monks, leaving their homeland likely never to return. Leaving all you love is white martyrdom. This may be the first poem in that long Irish tradition of immigration. The sun returning in the east can be seen as a metaphor for the dawn of the second coming of Christ. Alex has discussed how monks such as Columbanus had a belief of doomsday as imminent, given that Christianity had reached the ends of their known world, which was Ireland. And that is reflected here in this stanzas from one of the poems uh, attributed to Columbanus. There's two of the stanzas from that poem. This world shall pass, daily it declines, none shall remain living, no one has remained alive. It is fitting that you think of all these things, my friend. Far be it from you to love the pattern of this life. This promoted a sense of mission, this idea of doomsday near. It promoted a sense of mission for Columbanus and his followers to carry their core of Christianity back to the post-Roman Europe, especially to the overlooked rural places and despite the challenging waves against their mission. Though there was much darkness, cold and death in the world, there was hope for the time when sun returns brilliance to the lands. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for taking on that wonderful poetic journey. And <clears throat> I think the thing which has brought home to me really is the connection with the monks which lived a very solitary life, sitting in the scriptorium or in the end room. And um, the closeness to nature, which seems to come through, and particularly the blackbird, I'd never really noticed that before, but that seems to have been threading its way through some of the um, uh, poetry that you described there. Yeah, so many, anyway. many, many birds show up in, in many of the different poems. Blackbirds seem to show up the most, and it really does make sense. There really can be, for the solitary monk, there's a sense of companionship with birds. You know, and, and as I say, in one they called the little lad and in another my fellow monk, you know, so there was a real sense of affinity. Yes, and um, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, seeing that there's a question here in the chat room from Karen Douglas, but if you want to sort of put your, raise your hand, if you have a raise hand function, very welcome to do that. So Karen has asked if you can share the details of the book you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation. Okay, well, um, the book that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, um, well, I mentioned a few books. Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll just kind of go over some of the books which have, uh, are, are uh, wonderful. One is uh, James Carney, Medieval Irish Lyrics. Um, it, it's a very fine collection of early Irish poems. 
And one of the things that's very nice about this one is it, it shows the Irish also. Um, now, uh, another fine current book is called The Finest Music, an anthology of early Irish lyrics. Uh, this is a fairly new book. It was put together by a poet, Maurice Reardon, by Faber and Faber. And he's just collected some very fine um, translations by top poets. So this is another one, if somebody's of interest. Um, another one, which is certainly James Carney is very scholarly. Um, Early Irish Lyrics by Mur Murphy, Gerard Murphy um, is, is just, uh, he's got fine translations. They're a little more on the literal side, um, but he, he uh, he also has the Irish and he uh, has a very good introduction. And another favorite of mine is uh, by the great Kuno Meyer. Um, and now he, he died around 1918 or so. And he was really one of the real pioneers in Ireland in, in Celtic studies, along with Osborne Bergen. And so you can never go wrong and you can still get this one because it has been reprinted. Ancient Irish Lyrics by Kuno Meyer. So those are some of the ones. Um, the, the great short story writer, Frank O'Connor, uh, has, has written, um, has done wonderful translations. They're a little more on the free side, if you will. And um, so those, those are a few. So I hope I've answered the question because I'm not sure which particular book I mentioned. Um, Okay, thank you for, for, for that, Tim. Has anyone else any question they would like to, to ask? I don't see any hands going up here. Uh, one of the things I would like to ask, Tim, was um, with the last poem that you have translated, Land's Final Curve, can you just explain again where that the, the origin of that was? Yes. Um... Please. Near the beginning, um, this is a facsimile of the beginning. Now, this is, a, this is another manuscript um, that's in the St. Gall Library. And it's a large manuscript of lives of Irish saints. And, and one of them includes the life of Columbanus uh, by Jonas of Bobbio. And this is the, there are various, um, copies of this manuscript uh, in different places. Uh, the one at St. Gall is considered the one best preserved where most of it is there. Um, and this is, this is essentially the manuscript that Alexander O'Hara worked from. Um, now at the beginning, before you really get into the real story, there's a preface. Now often this preface has not really been given much attention. And uh, when Alexander and Ian Wood were working on their translation, Alexander really realized that within there was this poem. Um, you know, he, he was able to break it down to get it into the, uh, I, the, the right meter. And one thing, one thing when you read uh, the, the older scholars, they're very excited when they discover in an old manuscript a poem or some writing that had been overlooked. You know, it's like a great discovery. But we sort of, those great discoveries happened in the late 1800s, maybe up to the 1960s, but it seemed pretty much that people had gone through everything. And this was sort of like a, a, a discovery, I feel, in broad daylight. Um, so, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's wonderful to bring uh, that great poem to light because it does seem to have a lot of merit in, in terms of where it fits into the literary history of Irish poetry. Okay, thank you for that. Maura Foley, Maura, did you want to ask a question? You need to unmute yourself, Maura, please. Um, there's a question here. Uh, what, wasn't the words, world's final curve previously attributed to Jonas Bobbio? Probably it was, but also keep in mind that um, the writers back then often very liberally made use of other writings. 
Um, and often you might have older poems sometimes inserted in writings. So uh, Alex's uh, belief was that this, this poem itself was not written by Jonas of Bobbio, but I think also because of looking at the, the quality of the Latin, which made it more of a Hiberno Latin, whereas Jonas would be more uh, a more classical Latin. Um, you know, he believed that it was actually written by um, an Irish follower. So I'm going with that story because I like that story, David. So, sorry, uh, thank you for that, Tim. Um, Maura, do you want to unmute yourself? I can't hear you. Unmute. Oh, there we, there we are. are. It wouldn't unmute for me for a moment. I just, first of all, could I just say congratulations on such a lovely presentation? Uh, it just captured uh, everything that I love about Irish, the ancient Irish poetry, and your uh, ability to capture the assonance and the rhythms and uh, in such a lovely short manner. You really have got the spirit of it in, in your compositions as well as in your translations. I, I really enjoyed every minute of what you said. Um, I'm also uh, thinking in terms of uh, what you started to do was relate the patterns to the modern day in your references, in your little uh, verse which you gave us about the pandemic coming down on the train. It's, I think that's something terribly important that we don't just leave uh, in the past what is in the past, but rather we relate it to the present and so connect our ancient heritage with our modern problems because human nature doesn't change, maybe history changes, but we have so much to connect with. And I, I wonder what inspired you to do that on the train? Was it, was it a special event or was it just the way that you um, uh, had, had this feeling for the general feel of the Irish poetry? Oh, sure. Well, I think part of it is, um, uh, again, this, uh, the early Irish poetry has uh, been something that has inspired me for years. And, uh, and then certainly when I moved to Bangor a couple of years ago, I was, you know, very much excited that here I was in the landscape where these poems were, you know, crafted. So the poems were often quite with me. And I think the whole sense of the pandemic and some health issues, that there, there's a voice in these poems that, that really reach across time. And uh, so that, to me, they're not just quaint old poems. To me, they're much more current than much of the bardic poetry that comes a little bit later in Irish poetry, which can be kind of uh, stiff, can be like, uh, I'm, trying to, uh, I'm, I'm trying to match the other poet and, and elaborate and, and payday poetry because, okay, I wanna, I wanna get this, uh, this king to, to pay me some good money. I want, I want a good fat cow for this poem, you know? So it, 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 it's a different type of poetry. And, and, and I really think that there's a voice and you really get a sense of people who wrote these poems. And so, I mean, I, a lot of times those poems would just be kind of with me. And so I sometimes associate things with the poem. So when I had to take, uh, I had to go for a medical appointment at, during a bad time of COVID and I was coming home on the train, I, I was thinking, oh man, you know, all the teenagers are going to be on there. This is the time of day they wake up and go. Thank God for the rain. And then with that, the poem came back to me, you know. And yeah. so it was sort of a tribute to the poem. And, and it, it's a play. Uh, when you write poetry, one thing that can give you great enjoyment is a sense of a dialogue with other poems. Sometimes it'll be very evident in the poem you write. Sometimes it'll only be what you know as a poet. So a lot of just having a dialogue with those poems and a number of the poems I've, I've been writing, it really gives you, uh, you know, a, a sense of community. Yeah. yeah. The, there is also the, the fact that at the time that Congal founded his monastery here, plague was actually rife in the area. And it was also uh, true, true. Many monasteries and wiped out quite a few of the monks in different true, monasteries. True, true. Very so good I point. 
would think that your pandemic now relates very nicely to what was happening then. Oh yeah, very, very, very well put. I mean, I, I, I was aware of that, but it, it didn't really come. I, I knew that fact, but it, it was not an active awareness for me. But very good point. Very good mm. point. And would have heightened the feeling that uh, we were towards the end of the world that Colin Bannis true. brought. Very, very true. Very true. Was playing so often, you know. Uh, though, of course, theologically, that was a logical thing too, because uh, in in the poem, does it not refer to the the far the far edge of the world when the Christianity had come to Ireland? Logically, right. it could be the end of the world at that point. That's right. something. Alex O'Hara brings across too. Yes, you know. he brings it across very well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, thank, thank you. you um, I just want to ask uh, Nicola, you had um, wanted, did you want to just come in there? Nicola T. You're muted, Nicola. Nicola, you need to unmute. I still can't hear you, Nicola. You're still muted. Oh, there we are. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you now. Thanks, thanks, Deborah. And thanks for putting on this whole thing. It's been absolutely great. A lovely way to spend a Saturday morning. Thank you, Tim. Um, yes, my question is just, I was amazed. Um, I love the rhythm that we, I don't know any Irish at all. And um, you could just tell from the rhythm and you were listening to, um, to how you read out the, the Irish. But have you taught yourself and um, have you been learning for ages and ages? Is it something, you know, do they do a Berlitz guide to how to, uh, to pick it up easily or have you had lessons? Have you, have you? Yeah, I, um, well, I, um, I first, uh, a few years ago, um, I first started in, back in the States. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate that around where I was living, uh, we had a couple of very capable Irish speakers um, that, uh, were giving Irish classes. So I, I began uh, a few years ago, got away from it, and now over, just shortly before COVID began, um, uh, we're, we're actually, uh, it's very rich in the Belfast area in terms of resources to learn Irish. Uh, there's, uh, there's certainly, um, the, the uh, Kulturlan has classes, I've been taking classes at Andrahid, which is uh, a, a, a community center, but also it's a preschool, young classes, uh, what's called the Gwailsko, you know, where, where the children are learning in Irish. And I've been taking classes there. Um, there's, uh, there's classes quite a few places in the Belfast area. So now then with COVID, I've been taking my class through Andrahid online. And uh, I'm fortunate that my wife, Marianne McShane, uh, is quite capable in Irish. So um, she herself is, is uh, taking classes, you know, uh, to strengthen her Irish. But she's always a good one to help with pronunciation and, and different things like that. So, yeah. So it's something the old brain doesn't memorize as well as the young brain did, you know, but little by little, you know, um, you know, I'm building up the Irish. And it is great to, uh, you know, in, even though I could not translate an old Irish poem myself, it, it is great when you see uh, the number of words that are still in modern Irish, you know, so it is kind of exciting to see that. Yeah. Okay. But no, there, there's a very strong sense in the, in, in the Belfast area about, you know, Irish. There's there's a lot of people that that have a great respect and a great love for Irish. Okay, well, thank you for that. We're coming up to twelve o'clock. There's just one thing before we go that I wanted to raise, which I thought was a very good suggestion, Tim, and that was, um, you know, as you're walking along that coastal path, and I know many of you who are here today would quite often walk along that that um, path as well. You know, to put up sort of poems as you go along is what your suggestion was. Um, you know, do, just before we go, just expand a wee bit on that, how you see that being visualized. That's something maybe we could bring to council, you know, to have something put up somewhere uh, around the town, just, you know, reciting some of the poems which have been written in Bangor. Yeah, 
I think, I mean, again, you know, I have the poetic self-interest in it, but I think it would be a wonderful thing because my gosh, here we have the beautiful landscape that inspired many of these poems. And even if some of, even some additional poems that may not necessarily have been in Bangor, but are part of that monastic heritage. And, and just uh, how wonderful to have a path where there might also, along with the poems, be um, things that talk about how, how the monks, you know, you could, you could be going by a patch of holly and you could, you could have a plaque about how the monks would make one of their inks from holly, or you could have a place where there was, uh, you know, around Bangor Abbey, you know, there were remains of a mill that were found. It would just be great to have different things about the monastic life of that time, you know, on plaques, you know, throughout the mm -hmm. Colum Columban Way and particularly uh, along uh, the beautiful Belfast Lock. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, maybe it's something friend to Colin Banners could perhaps get some funding for and do. Probably need to get planning permission or goodness knows what to do that. But anyway, it's something for us to consider. Yeah, um, the, maybe the Department of Communities or the Heritage or something like that might might have a part to play in it. Yeah, you're you're, you're you're the one with the knowledge of of the inner workings of of government there. So <laughs> lucky to have you. I'm still learning after ten years. My goodness. Um, and just there's one here that I just want to to, to bring up and um, before we go, who's this here? Um, I just see yeah. uh, someone named Josephine. Uh, uh, mentioned there's one poem that Leanne has brought one up here the poem included in the signs the, the boating song oh the boat song yes yeah no yeah. that's a that that that's a great poem and uh Davy uh Davy has put that to music yeah there's a, a couple of translations of that someone someone uh no uh Josephine yeah a brilliant suggestion of poems along the path. The same has been done at Lock Bag with recordings of Seamus Heaney's voice. Well, that's great to know. And James O'Fee, anything on the coastal path and elsewhere is prone to vandalism. True, but you know, uh, you you have to, I think, take a take a challenge at that. Um, yeah, it seems like a lot of people like the idea of the poems along uh, the path here. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, look, on that nice note, I think we will say goodbye. I just want to just give one last um, look here. I want to thank everyone who joined uh, your lecture this morning. And sincerely thank you, Tim, for a wonderful presentation. And